Hallelujah. Good morning. God is so good. And we bless his name today. Come on, let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this morning. God, we thank you, Lord, for another opportunity to be in your presence, another opportunity, God, just to worship you together. Father, we thank you for this corporate environment that you provided for us. God, so that we can bless your name together. So, Father, we, your people, have come today just to lift you, to honor you, and to bless your name in worship. Now, come on, if that's why you came today, if you're in agreement, come on, can you just shout and say hallelujah? Hallelujah. Lord, we love you, God. We bless you. Hallelujah. And we adore your name. God, we thank you. Hallelujah. So this morning, we're just going to sing about the joy in the house of the Lord today. Amen. Hallelujah. Pull it up a little more, yeah. Say we worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. Come on, can we say it? There's joy. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out of your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out of your name. We shout out of your praise. We worship the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Because he hung up on that cross. Then he rose up from the grave. My God is still rolling stones away. Come on, say, there's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out of your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in his place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out Cause we were beggars and now we're royalty. We were prisoners and now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Cause we were better, and now we're royalty. We were prisoners, now we're running free. And we we're forgiven, except redeemed by this grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. There's joy! There's joy in the house of the Lord. Come on, everybody. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out of your praise. We shout out of your praise. Joy. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God, Our God is surely in this place. And we won't, and we won't be quiet. We shout out of your praise. We shout out of your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out of your praise.
long for to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. There's nothing worth more that can never come close.
so good to see each one of you this morning. I want to welcome all of you who are here with us. If it's your first time visiting with us, we thank God that he led you here this morning. We thank God for each one of you coming, and we're trusting that he had a reason for you to come, because he has something to say to us. I want to also welcome those who will be watching us online. Thank you for tuning in for, to for Love Bridge Church. Thank you for turning your computers on and listening to us and sharing in this worship experience with us. I'd like to start off by saying Happy Thanksgiving to each one of you. It is such a blessing to be in a country where we set aside a day of the year, where we go before the Lord with friends and family to say thank you. Thank you, God, for all that you have done. Thank you for who you are. I know a lot of you may be traveling, a lot of you may be fixing a lot of food for Thursday, but take the time out to say thank you to the Lord and even thank other people that's in your family that have been a blessing to you this year. Just remember that God wants us to have a, a heart of gratitude and we have so much to thank him for. And I know all of you are looking forward to getting together with your friends and with your family so have a great time and be safe. This morning, we're going to continue our study of the book of Jonah. If you've been with us this month, you know that we've been in that book and we've covered Jonah 1, 2, and today we're going to look at Jonah 3. There are some main focuses that I want to tell you up front that we're going to look at. And then I will show you through the scriptures how God has developed those points and how he wants me to communicate that to you. If you will open your book, we're going to be, look, your Bibles, we're going to be in Jonah 3, 1 through 10. And the title or the subject of what we're going to be looking at today is the greatness of God. In this particular book, you'll see the word great repeated over and over again. And there's a reason that the author, Jonah, does that. Because whenever you see this literary style of repeating words throughout the word of God, God wants us to stop and pay attention to that word. And the word that you will see in Jonah is great. The great whale, the great fish, the great wind. But the whole book, is about the greatness of God. We all know the story of Jonah, and we know about him running from God. In the first chapter, we see God told him to go to a nation called Nineveh, but he didn't want to go, so he went the opposite direction. We see that God then sends a great wind to get Jonah's attention. But today, what I want us to look at, all of the things that's happening, all of the, the incidents that happen within this book, I want you to stay focused on this one thing, that the book is really about the greatness of God. We'll see in this particular book, as Jonah said in chapter 2, that it's really all about the great salvation that God has given us. So our title is The Greatness of God, and it's really the salvation of the Lord, because that's where his greatness is on display. The main points that we're going to focus on this morning is that God's great grace saves Jonah from death in the sea. That's the first thing we're going to look at. 
God's great grace saves Jonah from death in the sea. God gives Jonah a second chance. And we're going to explore the fact, why? Why does God give Jonah a second chance? He told Jonah where to go, and Jonah went in the opposite direction. He disobeyed, he rebelled, but God gives him a second chance in chapter 3. God then shows great mercy to Nineveh, this city, this great city, as he calls it, that rebelled and that had all types of evil and wickedness in it. And we see in chapter 3 that this great God that we serve showed great grace and mercy to the city of Nineveh. But the greatest thing about this book, Jonah, that shows the greatness of God is that every aspect of the Word of God, there is a red line that flows from Genesis to Revelation, and that red line is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You will see that the prophet Jonah, there was a sign, the prophetic sign of Jonah points directly to the Lord Jesus Christ. So the greatness of God is shown in Jonah through his grace and his mercy, but the greatness of God is even more so on display by the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which Jonah was a prophetic example of that which was to come. So if you would open your Bibles or your devices, and we're going to start with Jonah 3, 1 through 10, and then I'm going to take you into Matthew to make clear the point that I made about the fact that Jonah is a prophetic sign of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'm going to be using the New King James Version today, so whatever version you have, please follow along with me. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. Now we know in chapter 1, he came to him the first time and told him what to do, and Jonah rebelled and did not do it. He tells him again, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, Yet forty days, in forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. God was going to destroy Nineveh. And that was the message that Jonah had come to preach. So the people of Nineveh believed God. They believed what Jonah was saying. And they proclaimed a fast. They put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then the word came up to the king, the king of Nineveh. And he arose from his throne and laid aside the robe. He too covered himself in sackcloth, and he sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and the nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from the fierce anger so that we may not perish? In verse 10, we see how God responds. Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. We see in this story 
the greatness of God and the fact that God has salvation throughout. And that's why we go into Matthew, the 12th chapter, if you would open your Bibles to that, and I'll show you how Jesus refers to Jonah's life, his life, as a sign of his own death, burial, and resurrection. In Matthew 12, 38 says, then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered saying, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign and no sign, no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with his generation and condemn it because they repented. They repented at the preaching of Jonah. And indeed, a greater Jonah is now here. God's great grace saves Jonah from death in the sea. And God uses the, the great fish as a way to discipline Jonah. So before we get into chapter three, I wanted to just make sure that we were on the same page when we look at the fact that it was God's grace that saved Jonah from the depths of that sea. In chapter two, it ends with Jonah crying out to the Lord, and he offers a prayer of thanksgiving. You remember, they were on the boat, and because the wind was going, this great wind came, and the only way that the storm could stop was that they had to throw Jonah overboard. When they threw him overboard, the storm stopped because God heard them, and he responded by stopping the great wind. The sailors on the boat, here they were Gentiles. And you have to remember, this is an Israeli. This is a Jewish prophet that God is sending into a Gentile nation. This is the first time that this has happened in the Old Testament. And there's a reason why God is doing this, and we'll explain this as we go into the text. But Jonah disobeyed God. God then sends a great wind to get Jonah's attention, and then he sends a fish to, to kind of take him up out of the waters. That great fish was God's deliverance for Jonah. Jonah confessed in John, John, Jonah 2, 9, you truly are the God of salvation. Because when Jonah was rescued, he knew that God had snatched him out of the grips of death. He knew the only person that could have saved him from the depths of drowning was God. Even though God used a fish, Jonah wasn't concerned about the fish. He was concerned of the fact that he had been saved from death. He's in the belly of the well, and you would think that in the belly, and I keep saying, well, I'm not going to do that again. It was a great fish, you all. <laughs> We're so used to, I'm so used to my Sunday school and my BTU saying, well, but if you look at the translation, it is, it was a great fish. And Jonah was in this great fish and he was in the belly of the great fish. And in that, you would think that Jonah would be saying, Lord, why did this happen? He knew why it happened because he was disobedient. But he offered a prayer of thanksgiving, you all. He didn't lament. He didn't complain about the smell and all of this stuff that was on him in the, in the, in the fish, but he remembered his, his God, and he called out to him in thanksgiving. In the midst of this trial, in the midst of this discipline, in the midst of this situation, he offers thanksgiving to God. He recognizes that you saved me from death. This fish is nothing compared to what you saved me from. I'm thanking you today, God. I'm offering thanksgiving because you truly are the God of salvation. That's what he was praising him for. That's what he was thanking him for. He, he had totally lost 
He didn't even pay attention to the fact that he was in the belly of a big fish because of what God had done. God used that great wind and he used the big fish to discipline Jonah. It was an act of love. God disciplines proves that he loves us just like it proved that he loved Jonah. I can show you in scripture where he reminds us that if you're my child, just like Jonah was his child, and Jonah was in disobedience, I am going to correct you. I'm going to discipline you. I'm going to send a great storm. I'll send a great fish. I'll send trials. I'll send adversities. And I'm doing it because I love you. And that's what he does for Jonah. Let's look at Proverbs 3, 11, and 12 and see what he tells us in his word about this discipline process. He says, my child, don't reject the Lord's discipline. And don't be upset when he corrects you. For when the Lord loves, whom the Lord loves, he what? He corrects. Just as a father, the son in whom just as a father, the son in whom he delights, he will correct them. In the New Living Translation, he says, my child, don't reject the Lord's discipline and don't be upset when he corrects you. Jonah had gotten past his rebellion and he was just thankful that God had saved him from death. And now the correction, he realized that God had done it out of love. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects. He loved Jonah. And he loves you and I. And whom he loves, he will correct. He also tells us this in Hebrews 12 and 10. For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best they knew how. But God's discipline is always good for us so that we might share in his holiness. No discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. Is that correct? <laughs> I got an amen over here in the corner. <laughs> no discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. It's painful. But afterwards, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in that way. You all, Jonah was in training. God was training him. Training him to hear his voice and obey. Training him to get him to the place where he would surrender his will to God's will. That's what he's doing to us also. Whenever God brings trials and adversities in our lives, whenever we're faced with situations that we don't know how to handle, God is put, has us in training. He's training us because what is it that he wants to do? He wants to break us from depending upon what we know how to do and begin to depend upon him and trust him. Jonah went his own way. He bought a ticket, got on a boat, and went the opposite direction. God says, no, I have something for you to do over here in Nineveh. And so I'm going to get you there. I'm going to send a great wind and I'm going to send a fish. God sometimes tells us to do things and we say, I'm going to go the opposite direction. God says, okay, but I'm going to send something to get you back on track. He's training us, you all. We have to receive everything that comes into our lives as from God. If you are a child of God, like Jonah was, everything that comes into your life, God uses it to transform you and to shape you and to mature you to the place where you're able to live this life that Christ died on the cross for you to live. Why would he come and give his life, shed his blood, give us a brand new life, and then we stay in the way that Jonah was, in rebellion and disobedience? Why would we, he allow us to stay there? I'm letting you know today he won't. He will not. He'll send 
whatever he has to say in your pathway in order to get you back on track. Jonah saw God's great grace and mercy. It was grace that saved him. It was God's mercy that corrected him. It is God's great grace that saves us. And in his mercy and his loving kindness that he uses in order to correct us. God's discipline proves his love for Jonah. It caused Jonah to obey. That's what got him to the place of obedience. I know I sometimes I tell the Lord, Lord, if you show it to me in your word, I'm willing to obey. I don't need to be corrected. I don't need to have a whooping. I was one of those children in my family. I was the compliant child. Whatever, everybody raise your hand. I was one of those. If mama said do it, what? You were going to do it. Why? Because we did not to like to get what? Whippings. And I know some of the young people don't even know what that word is. <laughs> They don't even know what that means. But in your words, we didn't like punishment. We didn't like to be put in on punishment. Back when I was coming up, <clears throat> we just didn't like to get whipped. <laughs> some of people in your family, you had some who would like Jonah. Mama say do something, they went what? The opposite direction. We had people in my family, I'm not gonna call my sister's name, but anyway. Whatever it was that mama said, she was going to go the opposite way. And one day I asked her, I said, why? She says, because I can have my own way. A whooping only lasts for a few minutes. And I was, okay, that's your reasoning, but I don't quite get that one. But Jonah was disciplined, and God loved him enough to correct him, just like our parents loved us to correct us. It's all out of love, you all. And it's all out of God's love that he does that. So as we go into see what happens now that he's been saved by God's grace and he's been disciplined, what is Jonah's response now? And we see that in chapter 3. God gives Jonah a second chance. And he does that because God, Jonah's heart was open to receive the discipline of God. He didn't despise it, he thanked him for it. He was in the fish and he's thanking God. So now the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time and we're gonna go back and, and, and trace what's happening in, um, in, in Jonah 3, 1 and 2. We're at Jonah 3, 1 and 2. The word of the Lord came to him a second time. Now the first time he rebelled and went the opposite direction. What do you think he's gonna do this time after getting out of that fish? I think Jonah is gonna obey. He came to Jonah the second time saying, arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and preach to it the message. Jonah still had to obey what God said. God didn't change it. He did not change it. He did not say, okay, I guess what, since the fish put you over here, I'll just let you go to this town. No. God says, no, you're gonna do what I said the first time. How many of your parents, I know my mama used to tell me that, you're going to do what I said the first time. They don't ever change what they tell you to do. God didn't change, don't tell Jonah to change anything. You're going to Nineveh. Even though Jonah hated those people, and there was a reason he hated them, because they were ruthless. They were evil. They were a large city that was full of people. In war, they were ruthless. If you study what happened, uh, it, they, it's part of Assyria. Whenever they went into a city and conquered it, what they did to the people they conquered was horrible. Jonah knew how evil they were, but he obeyed God. This time he does. God gave Jonah a second chance. And why do you think he did? After being in a disobedience, sometimes when we are disobeying God, we think, oh my God, God is not going to be able to use me because of what I have done. But I want you to be aware this morning that when God has a plan, if you disobey, he's going to correct you. 
because he is going to accomplish the works that he has preordained for you to do. You are his workmanship, created unto Christ Jesus for works that were preordained before you were even born. God wrote out what it is that he had for you to do. You can fight him all you want to. You can run to Joppa, you can run to Tarshish, but you will accomplish what God created you to do in his kingdom. So what we, I want to show you in scripture how it is that God gave him a second chance and why does he, I told I wasn't gonna do that, and why he gives us a second chance. He gives us a second chance if you turn to Lamentation 3.22. It's in scripture. It says it plainly. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. Lamentations 3.22. His mercies never cease. Great is his what? Faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh when? Every day. Every day, he gave him a, new, a second chance because it was God's mercies that are fresh every day. God's love for Jonah did not end. I say to you, the Lord is my inheritance. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, my hope is in him. Jonah, God saved Jonah because God's will still had to be done. God allowed Jonah a second chance because he used Jonah's experience to demonstrate his love for the entire world. This wasn't about Jonah, you all. This was about what God needed to accomplish through Jonah. This was about God having a bigger plan than Jonah could have even imagined. God needed for Nineveh to be preached to he was the first Israelite, the first Israel prophet to go into Nineveh. And why did I say that this demonstrated God's love for the entire world? Because up until this point in the Old Testament, all of the covenants, all of the, the, the language of the Old Testament was to the covenant people of Israel. God has said, I need to put right in the middle of the Old Testament, right here, to show them through Jonah that my love and my redemption and my plan of salvation is for the whole world. That's why he sent Jonah to the Gentiles. That's why he sent this prophet to the Gentiles. That's why those Gentile soldiers were saved on that boat. Because God wanted to demonstrate in the Old Testament, I'm not just going to share my love and my redemption with the covenant people of Israel. Yes, they're my chosen people, but I promised Abraham back in Genesis 12 that the whole world was going to be blessed through him. And so now I'm using the prophet Jonah to prove to you and to prove to everyone that the Gentiles are included in God's plan of redemption. So this thing that Jonah was involved in was way bigger than what he could even imagine. It was in God's overall plan of redemption, his overall plan of salvation. God wanted man to know I have come to save the whole world, not just the children of Israel. He gave him a second plan, chance because God's great grace and great mercy was toward Jonah. Jonah obeyed God this time, and because he did, God gave him the second chance. He used Jonah to let you and I know that redemption the whole world is included in it. But even when we come and take this from a personal viewpoint, God gives all of us second chances, third chances, fourth chances, fifth chances, sixth chances, as many chances as he allows because he is slow to anger. And his mercies are new every day. And every day we wake up, we have an opportunity to experience God's grace and God's mercy. There is no forgiveness. There is nothing that you can do that has not been covered by the blood of Jesus. There is nothing that you can find yourself involved in that God will not forgive you for. He just wants you to come and to repent and ask for forgiveness. God gives so many chances because his grace and his mercies are new every morning. 
He's true to his word. When he says that, he means that. As you look back on your life, how many chances have God given you? How many chances have you experienced his mercy and his grace? How many chances when you look back, you, he has kept you from danger? How he has guided you? If we look back on our lives, we can see the hand of God. We can see his grace and his mercy. We can see the number of chances that he gives us in order to come to know him. How many of us before accepted him as our Lord and Savior that we go to so many revivals and so many people tried to share the gospel and we said no, we didn't want to know anything about him. But God didn't give up on us. He did not give up on us. Because you see, we have a father that already knows the end from the beginning. He already knew when you were going to accept him. He knew how you were going to accept him. So he would never give up on you. And for you who are out there today who have not accepted him, who don't believe that he is who he says he is, God's not going to give up on you either. There are so many of us that are praying for our relatives and friends to get saved. Keep praying because God's not going to give up on them. He gives them a second chance, a third chance, until their last breath before they leave this earth. God is constantly kind to get them to be saved. As we can continue to look at verses 3 and 4 in Jonah 3, you see that Jonah obeyed God this time. He got a second chance. God's grace was with him. So Jonah rose up and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was a exceedingly great city. It was three days' journey around it. And Jonah goes into the city the very first day. He didn't wait. He didn't try to figure out. He didn't pray about it. He didn't say, Lord, can I think about this for a minute? Should I just stop? No. God had gotten Jonah's attention. Jonah went in there preaching. Jonah went in there saying what God told him to say. He walked the city. And just like the pastor said, this is equivalent of God telling one of us to go to New York and declare the gospel in that whole city, the whole city of New York, because according to the commentaries I read, it was approximately two million people in this large, large city are coming into Atlanta and say, I want you to go into Atlanta, preach the gospel, and the whole city of Atlanta will be saved. This is what we're talking about. This is the massiveness of this. Jonah goes in, and he says, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. It was a cry for that great city. It was a, a, a warning to them, a warning of judgment. But the thing of it is, is that they heard Jonah. They heard him. And God showed great mercy to Nineveh, this great city. God showed great mercy to Nineveh, a great city. This was the biggest, the largest revival in the history of mankind. There is no other revi revival recorded anywhere in the history of man this large. So when I say this book had a whole bunch of greatness in it, we had a great fish, a great wind, we had our great God orchestrated it all, but the greatest miracle that's in this book is the fact that a whole city repented and was saved. A whole Gentile city. Nowhere else in the history of man did that many people get saved in such a short period of time. We saw in the New Testament when they preached the resurrection of Jesus, 3,000 people were added to the church. But in Jonah, it talks about the fact that even the children, they talk about at least 120,000 children, so you know it was a bunch of older, so it was at least a million. Can you imagine two million people getting saved at one time? You see that this is God's overall plan. He set this in motion. He's the one that's guiding this because he wanted the world to know, I have a prophet that's coming to the Gentiles. And right now I'm talking to the Israelites, but one day the Gentiles are going to come to me. 
And I want to demonstrate that to you through the prophet Jonah. So the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, a fast. And I'm now in Jonah 3, 5. We're in Jonah 3, 5. They proclaimed the fast, put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then the word came to the king of Nineveh, and he rose from his throne and sat on his side. So you see, the king also put out the decree. When they talk about putting on sackcloth and ashes, you all in the Old Testament, what they mean there is that they were so sorrowful for their sin. They were so regretful that the inward part, they expressed it by putting on this rough skin that was made from, from goat's hair. But it was really rough. They took off all their comfortable clothes and put on their rough clothes and it's a way of expressing outwardly, I am so sorry, I repent of what I have done. They repented, the whole city repented and cried out to God and turned to God. The king not only did that, he also told them we're going to have a fast. The humans are not going to eat, don't even let your, your animals eat. We're going to fast and cry out to God. Maybe he'll turn. Maybe he won't destroy us. They were sorrowful for their sins. They expressed it. They showed God that they repented. And we see in verse 10, we go to verse 10, that God responded to them, and God did not destroy them. He saw their works. They turned from their evil way, and God did not destroy Nineveh. God saw their works. He saw that they believed him, and he did not destroy them. God was acting in total consistency with his word. He didn't change what he would do according to his word. If you look to, with me in Jeremiah 18, 7 through 8, God says this in Jeremiah, the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to pluck it up, to pull down, and to destroy it. If that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. He also states this in another verse that a lot of us are so familiar with, in 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by what? My name. Shall humble themselves and what? Pray and turn from their what? Wicked ways. What will happen? Then I will hear from heaven. I will what? Forgive their sin and heal their land. That's what he did for Nineveh. They re cried out to him, they repented, and God healed their land. He stopped the disaster. God honors Nineveh's repentance, even though, listen, even though their past sins gave him reason. Everything they had done in the past was a just reason for God to destroy them. But because of their repentance, God, in this point in history, stopped the destruction. We do know later on through the prophet Nahum, after 150 years, 150 years, they lived in honor of God. But after 150 years, they went back to their wicked ways. But for this point in time, God relented and he did not. Can you imagine that if someone is on death row, and they've killed 20 or 30 people. This is how egregious this is. And the judge then says, he says, I promise I won't do it again. And the judge says, okay, you're free to go. What would you all do? Everybody would get on Facebook, Twitter, everything else complaining about this judge has let a, a serial killer off because he promised not to do it again. That's what Nineveh did. Nineveh promised God that they would not, they would turn from their evil ways. And in spite of all their past sins, God relented. He honored their repentance. God, in his great mercy and grace, has shown us this morning through Nineveh 
that he saves us, even in our sins. He saved Jonah when he was in rebellion. We also see that God forgives us, but we do not obligate God, and this is a key point, we do not obligate God to forgive us when we repent. Instead, repentance appeals to God's mercy and not his justice. We don't ask God for justice. We ask God for his mercy. And because of that, we see that God's grace and his mercy is extended to each one of us. He showed, showed, he showed great mercy to Nineveh, a great city. And he also showed great mercy to us. Jonah, as I stated, is the prophetic sign of the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus refers to Jonah's life as a sign of his own death, burial, and resurrection. We see this in the book of Matthew, which we read earlier. I won't read that again, but I just wanted you, let's just look at verse Matthew 12, 39. Go to that. But he answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. For as Jonah was in the grave three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be there three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus uses Jonah's life, his experience in the great fish, as a sign, a historical prophecy of his own death, burial, and resurrection. In Jonah, we see the greatness of God's mercy on Jonah and on Nineveh. But in Jesus, I want you to know you can experience that great grace and that great mercy. When Jonah preached to the Gentiles, they believed God. They repented and they were spared. When Jesus, the Messiah, who was greater than Jonah, when he came to the people of his own, they did not believe him. They rejected him. Jesus, the Messiah, is greater than Jonah, but they didn't believe him. How much greater is the witness of Jesus, who died on the cross, was buried three days and three nights, and rose from the dead? Here, Jonah was a man who hated the Ninevites. He preached to them, and they believed him. God, they didn't, he didn't like the people in Nineveh. He wanted them to die. He was a messenger of wrath from God. But what we have here, Jesus is a message of grace and salvation. If you don't repent, he told Nineveh, you will be destroyed. But Jesus says, when you trust in me, you are free from the penalty of sin and there is no judgment. You receive eternal life. The question I have for you this morning Will you believe what God tells you? Will you believe the report or this word, what he says to us? Or you, will you be like Jonah the first time? Will you be like the city of Nineveh? When, God, when Jonah preached to, him, to them, they believed him. They repented and God spared them. When we trust Jesus, when we trust him and we believe that he is who he says he is, that he died on the cross, he was buried, just like Jonah was put in the well, in the fish, we can receive him as our personal savior. What I want you to see in Jonah, as a prophetic book, what God did was that he used the prophecy of Jonah's life to point us all to Jesus. Jesus then uses Jonah and says, the sign that I'm going to give you, that I am the Messiah, is the sign of Jonah. 
Just as Jonah got up out of the belly of that great fish after three days and three nights, I too will get up from the belly of the earth. I will be raised from the dead and you will then know that I am the Messiah. That's what he told the children of Israel. That's what he told the Pharisees and Sadducees. That's why he pointed back to Jonah. And they must have believed him, you all, because what did they do on the grave? They said, he said he was going to get up after three days, and they went and put a stone and put Roman soldiers there. They wouldn't accept him as the Messiah, but they did take notice of the fact that Jesus said he was going to get up. And because Jesus got up, we too can get up from the depth of the sea of death. God has saved us from the clutches of death. We were dead in trespasses and sin. We were just like Jonah in that sea, sinking, as the old song, sinking to rise no more. But it was love that reached out and did what? He grabbed all of us and he saved us. It was his great love that saved us, just like he saved Jonah. And not only did he save us, you all, he gave us a brand new life. He moved us from darkness to light. He moved us from death to life. And then he says, I'm going to give you a Holy Spirit so that you can live this life that I came to give to you. He filled us with the Holy Spirit. He gave us the Holy Spirit so that we can walk in this new life. We don't have to concern ourselves with the city of Nineveh. They went back. They did not last. After 150 years, they went back. But God said, I'm the one that's going to keep you. Once you're saved, you're always saved. You have eternal life. You don't have to worry about losing it. The Ninevites lost theirs, but you don't have to worry because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. How is it that God could save a city so evil? How is it that he could save me? Sin is sin. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is no little sins and big sins in God's eyes. It's just sin. And God saved us all. God was able, you all, to save the city of Nineveh. Because you see, in the Old Testament, people that got saved, they were looking toward the cross. They were looking to the cross. And you have to understand that Jesus was crucified before the foundation of the world. God put all this in place even before he put us on this earth. This whole plan of salvation, this great plan of salvation was put in place before any of us were born. Before the foundation of the world, he was crucified. So that's why in the Old Testament, everybody that got saved was looking forward to the cross. And here we are looking back at it because we have seen the grace of God. We've seen that Christ came and he died and he was buried and he, was ro he rose from the dead. And because he got up, you all, because he got up, we too have life. This morning, if there's anyone here, maybe you are like Nineveh. Maybe you feel like that you've done so many horrible things that there's just no way that God could save you. But if God can save a city, if he can save a city that was ruthless and they cried out to him, the scripture says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. All he needs for you to do is realize that he's already paid the penalty. He paid the price. There is no more punishment for sin. When Jesus died on that cross, when he gave his life, God was satisfied. He was satisfied. Justice was taken care of. There is no more sacrifice for sin. There is no more penalty for it because it was taken care of on the cross. All he needs for you to do is to accept and receive what he's already done. To as many as receive him, to him he gave the power to become children of God. If Nineveh can believe Jonah, 
a man who hated them. Why can't we believe the one who so loved us that he gave his only life? Why can't we believe and receive that? So I'm gonna ask the prayer counselors to come. And if you need to receive him today, please come. If you need prayer, if you need to have a better understanding of what this life is that God has given you, please come and we're here to help you. Because one of the things we want you to do is to know that God wants you to live this abundant life. He didn't come to die just for you to get saved and sit down. No, there's a great life. There's a great life that he has for you to live. And he has something for you to do. Just like he had Jonah going to Nineveh, he didn't change that. And he's not going to change what he created you to do. So as we sing, come. If you want to accept the Lord Jesus Christ, if you need a church home, we'd love to have you here at Love Bridge. If you need prayer, we will pray for you. But listen to the voice of God and obey. Just as Jonah did the second time. And obey. Just as the Ninevites did when they heard the word of God. He is jealous for me. Love's like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory, then I realize just how beautiful you are how great your affections are for me and oh how he loves us so oh how he loves us how he loves us Oh! 
portion and he is our prize drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes and the grace is an ocean we're all sinking yeah no heaven meets earth like an unforeseen kiss and my heart beats violently inside of my chest and i don't have the time to maintain these regrets when i think about the way he loves us oh how he loves us oh how he loves us oh Think about the way. 